shocker. Um, there's some cool stuff at the front of this book, by the way. There's like a little ode oh. to Slytherin, mm. and there's a map. Bro, that's my phone. Stop it. Mm, she's cute. Hey, mommy. Boop, boop, boop. Uh, yeah, because this is so. There's oh. a map of Hogwarts. I can't lose the page. You got the page. Cool. Very cool. Mermaid. Do Octopus. Little arena. Mm -hmm. Quidditch pitch. Pitch. Hagrid's cabin. Squish stadium. That's what it says. Yeah, I guess it is a stadium. Broom shed. Okay, cute. Love it. Here we go. Uh, and the Slytherin, an introduction, and there's like a beautiful little illustration of the Salazar Slytherin. Bad guy. He's a bad man. Okay, anyway, we're up to chapter eight. Okay, I'm ready. Okay. Sorry. You never said hello. Oh, sorry. That's what I was waiting for. Hello, everyone. We're hello. back. And we're happy to be back. What should I, I don't know what to say. Um, it's chapter eight. Flight of the Fat Lady. Oh, yeah. Mm. Uh, oh. I'm going to wear the headphones today because... The audio quality is really, really bad in the last chapter. So I'm just making sure it all sounds good and Gigi doesn't stuff anything up and hopefully it'll be better this time. Okay, okay chapter eight, Flight of the Fat Lady. In fact, halfway through the chapter, I'll give you the headphones. Okay, thank cause you. Because it sounds good too. Real life sounds bad, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. <sighs> Maybe we need hearing aids, that's what we Probably. Need. This must be what everybody yeah. hears and we're just deaf. Yeah. we got to stop using cotton buds. <laughs> In no time at all, Defense Against the Dark Arts had become most people's favourite class. Only Draco Malfoy and his gang of Slytherins had anything bad to say about Professor Lupin. Look at the state of his robes, Malfoy would say in a loud whisper as Professor Lupin passed. He dresses like our old house elf. But no one else cared that Professor Lupin's robes were patched and frayed. His next few lessons were just as interesting as the first. After Boggarts, they studied red caps, nasty little goblin-like creatures that lurked wherever they, there had been bloodshed, in a dungeon of castles and the potholes of deserted battlefields, waiting to bludgeon those who had lost. From red caps, they moved on to cappers, creepy water dwellers that looked like scaly monkeys with webbed hands itching to strangle unwitting waders in their ponds. Harry only wished he was as happy with some of his other classes. Worst of all was potions. Snape was in a particularly vindictive mood these days, and no one was in any doubt why. The story of the Bogart assuming Snape's shape, and the way that Neville had dressed it in his grandmother's clothes, had travelled through the school like wildfire. Snape didn't seem to find it funny. His eyes flashed menacingly at the very mention of Professor Lupin's name, and he was bullying Neville worse than ever. Harry was also growl growing to dread the hours he spent in Professor Trawley's stifling tower room, deciphering lopsided shapes and symbols, trying to ignore the way Professor Trawley's enormous eyes filled with tears every time she looked at him. He couldn't like Professor Trawley, even though she was treated with respect bordering on reverence by many of the class. Pavati Patil and Lavender Brown had taken to haunting Professor Trawley's tower room at lunchtimes, and always returned with annoyingly superior looks on their faces, as though they knew things the others didn't. They had also started hushed voices whenever they spoke to Harry, as though he was on his deathbed. Nobody really liked care of magical creatures, which, after the action-packed first class, had become extremely dull. Hagrid seemed to have lost his confidence. They were now spending lesson after lesson learning our learning how to look after flobberworms, which had to be some of the most boring creatures in existence. Why would anyone bother looking after them, said Ron, after yet another hour of poking shredded lettuce down the flobberworms' slimy throats. At the start of October, however, 
Harry had something else to occupy him, something so enjoyable it made up for his unsatisfactory classes. The Quidditch season was approaching, and Oliver Wood, captain of the Gryffindor team, called a meeting one Thursday evening to discuss tactics for the new season. There were seven people on a Quidditch team, three chasers, whose job it was to score goals by putting the quaffle, a red football-sized ball, through one of the 50-foot-high hoops at each end of the pitch, two beaters, who were equipped with heavy bats to repel the bludgers, two heavy black balls, which zoomed around trying to attack the players, a keeper, who defended the goalposts, and the seeker, who had the hardest job of all, that of catching the golden snitch, a tiny winged walnut-sized ball whose capture ended the game and earned the Seekers team an extra 150 points. The hardest job. I would say that's the easiest job. You've only got to mm. think about one thing. Just get that ball. It, all, all the complexities of that game are completely lost to the Seeker. Of course, it's Harry saying that. <laughs> Maybe the goalkeeper's the easiest. Oliver Wood was a burly yeah, 17. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. I think that about football, though. So. <laughs> I don't think so. In football sometimes. It's a hard job. But I wouldn't want you, to do you it. You get in, in the spot sometimes, you know, and you mm. can, like, mess up in football. That's true. But, yeah. Okay. Oliver Wood was a burly 17-year-old, now in his seventh and final year at Hogwarts. There was a quiet sort of desperation in his voice as he addressed his six fellow team members in the chilly changing rooms on the edge of the darkening Quidditch pitch. This is our last chance, my last chance, to win the Quidditch Cup, he told them, striding up and down in front of them. I'll be leaving at the end of this year. I'll never get another shot at it. Gryffindor haven't won for seven years now, okay? So we've had the worst luck in the world. Injuries, then the tournament getting called off last year, Wood swallowed, as though the memory still brought a lump to his throat. But we also know we've got the best ruddy team in the school, he said, punching a fist into his other hand, the old manic glint back in his eye. We've got three superb chasers, Wood pointed at Elisa Spinnet, Angelina Johnson and Katie Bell. We've got two unbeatable beaters. Stop it, Oliver, you're embarrassing us, said Fred and George Weasley together, pretending to blush. And we've got a seeker who has never failed to win us a match. Wood rumbled, glaring at Harry with a kind of furious pride. And me, he added as an afterthought. We think you're very good too, Oliver, said George. Cracking keeper, said Fred. The point is, Wood went on, resuming his pacing, the Quidditch Cup should have had our name on it these last two years. Ever since Harry joined the team, I've thought the thing was in the bag, but we haven't got it. And this year's the last chance we'll get to finally see our name on the thing. Wood spoke so dejectedly that even Fred and George looked sympathetic. Oliver, this year's our year, said Fred. We'll do it, Oliver, said Angelina. Definitely, said Harry. Full of determination, the team started training sessions. Three evenings a week. The weather was getting colder and wetter, the nights darker, but no amount of mud, wind or rain could tarnish Harry's wonderful vision of finally winning the huge silver Quidditch Cup. Harry returned to the Gryffindor common room one evening after training, cold and stiff, but pleased with the way practice had gone, to find the room buzzing excitedly. What happened? he asked Ron and Hermione, who was sitting in two of the best chairs by the fireside and completing some star charts for astronomy. First Hogsmeade weekend, said Ron, pointing at a notice that appeared on the battered old notice board. End of October, Halloween. Excellent, said Fred who had followed Harry through the portrait hole. I need to visit Zonko's. I'm nearly out of stink pellets. Harry threw himself into a chair beside Ron, his high spirits ebbing away. Hermione seemed to read his mind. Harry, I'm sure you'll be able to go next time, she said. They're bound to catch Black soon. He's been sighted once already. Black's not fool enough to try anything in Hogsmeade, said Ron. Ask McGonagall if you can go this time. Harry, the next one might not be for ages. Ron, said Hermione, Harry's supposed to stay in school. He can't be the only third year left behind, said Ron. Ask McGonagall. Go on, Harry. Yeah, I think I will, said Harry, making up his mind. Hermione opened her mouth to argue, but at that moment, 
Crookshank slept lightly onto her lap. A large, dead spider was dangling from his mouth. Does he have to eat that in front of us, said Ron, scowling. Clever Crookshanks. Did you catch that all by yourself, said Hermione. And uh, Hermione. Yeah. Clever. Kitty. And Gigi Whatever is you do. Crookshanks. I don't know where Gigi is. Why don't we name Gigi Crookshanks? Because Crookshanks is a rubbish name. It's funny though, Crookshanks. Can you imagine? Come here, Crookshanks. Go on, Crookshanks, every time we want to Crookshanks. Look. Gigi. Boom. Nice. Yeah. That's true. Concise. Her name's pretty cool, but like, Crookshanks funny. Sleeping. Or just like Shanks. She's sleeping on the bed. Yeah. This is the oh best God. she's ever been. We might not put her away this chapter. She might make it the whole way through. <laughs> no. Crookshanks slowly chewed up the spider, his yellow eyes fixed insolently on Ron. Just keep him over there, that's all, said Ron irritably, turning back to his star chart. I've got scabbers asleep in my bag. Harry yawned. He really wanted to go to bed but he still had his own star chart to complete. He pulled his bag towards him, took out parchment, ink and quill, and started work. You can copy mine if you like, said Ron, labelling his last star with a flourish and shoving the chart towards Harry. Hermione, who disapproved of copying, pursed her lips, but didn't say anything. Crookshanks was still staring, unblinkingly at Ron, flicking the end of his bushy tail. Then, without warning, he pounced. Oi! Ron roared, seizing his bag as Crookshank sank four sets of claws deeply into it and began tearing ferociously. Get off, you stupid animal! Ron tried to pull the bag away from Crookshanks, but Crookshanks clung on, spitting and slashing. Ron! What? I said damn to Crookshanks, spitting and doing bad stuff. Ron, don't hurt him, squealed Hermione. The whole common room was watching. Ron whirled the bag around. Crookshank still clinging to it. Then scabbers came flying out of the top. Catch that cat, Ron yelled as Crookshanks freed himself from the remnants of the bag, sprang over the table and chased after the terrified scabbers. George Weasley made a lunge for Crookshanks but missed. Scabbers streaked through 20 pairs of legs and shot beneath an old chest of drawers. Crookshanks skidded to a halt, crouched low on his bandy legs and started making furious swipes beneath the chest of drawers with his front paw. Ron and Hermione hurried over. Hermione grabbed Crookshanks around the middle and heaved him away. Ron threw himself into his stomach and with great difficulty pulled Scabbers out by the tail. Look at him, he said furiously to Hermione, dangling Scabbers in front of her. His skin and bones. You keep that cat away from him. Crookshanks doesn't understand it's wrong, said Hermione, her voice shaking. All cats chase rats, Ron. There's something funny about that animal, said Ron, who was trying to persuade a frantically wriggling Scabbers back into his pocket. It heard me say that Scabbers was in my bag. Oh, what rubbish, said Hermione impatiently. Crookshanks could smell him. Ron, how else do you think? That cat's got it in for Scabbers, said Ron, ignoring the people around him, who was starting to giggle. Scabbers, Scabbers was here first, and, and he's ill. Ron marched through the common room and out of sight, up the stairs to the boys' common rooms. Ron was still in a bad mood with Hermione next day. He barely talked to her all through Herbology, even though he, Harry and Hermione were working together on the same puffer pod. How's Scabbers? Hermione asked timidly, as they stripped fat pink pods from the plants and emptied the shining beans into a wooden pail. He's hiding at the bottom of my bed, shaking, said Ron angrily. Missing the pail and scattering beans over the greenhouse I would feel bad if I didn't know what Crookshank is. Sorry, Scabbers yes. is. Sorry, I said yeah. the wrong there. I was like, oh, I was like, oh, <coughs> no. Crookshanks is a G, Sorry. a real, yeah. real yeah. cat. Yeah, that's what I, I meant, mm. Scabbers, yeah. Yeah, good job, Crookshanks. Careful, Weasley, careful, cried Professor Sprout as the burst beans into bloom before their very eyes. They had transfiguration next. Harry, who had resolved to ask Professor McGonagall after the lesson whether he could go into Hogsmeade with the rest, joined the queue outside the classroom, trying to decide how he was going to argue his case. He was distracted, however, by a disturbance at the front of the line. Lavender Brown seemed to be crying. Pavardi had her arm around her and was explaining something to Seamus Finnegan and Dean Thomas, who were looking very serious. "'What's the matter, Lavender?' said Hermione anxiously, 
as she, Harry and Ron went to join the group. She's got a letter from home this morning, Pavardi whispered. It's, it's her rabbit, Blinky. He's been killed by a fox. Oh, said Hermione. I'm sorry, Lavender. I, I should have known, said Lavender tragically. You know what day it is. Uh, the 16th of October. The thing you're dreading. It will happen on the 16th of October, remember? She was right. She was right. The whole class was gathered around Lavender now. Seamus shook his head seriously. Hermione hesitated. Then she said, You... You were dreading Blinky being killed by a fox. Well, not necessarily by a fox, said Lavender, looking up at Hermione with streaming eyes. But I was obviously dreading him dying, wasn't I? Oh, said Hermione. She paused again. Then, was Blinky an old rabbit? No, sobbed Lavender. He was only a baby. Pavardi mm. tightened her arm around Lavender's shoulders. But then, then why were you dreading him dying, said Hermione. Pavardi glared at her. Well, look at it logically, said Hermione, turning to the rest of the group. I mean, Blinky didn't even die today, did he? Lavender just got the news today. Lavender wailed loudly. And she can't have been dreading it because it's come as a real shock. Don't mind Hermione, Lavender, said Ron loudly. She doesn't think other people's pets matter very much. Professor McGonagall opened the classroom door at that moment, which was perhaps lucky. Hermione and Ron. Do you were... think that way? Do you think she doesn't care about other people's pets, or she? I think she does. I think, I think a... she was just thinking, well, like, this yeah, subject's that's... rubbish. Yeah, exactly. And, like, that's ha- what I thought too. Yeah. Okay. Good. Hermione and Ron were looking daggers at each other, and when they got into class, they seated themselves either side of Harry and didn't talk to each other all lesson. <laughs> Harry still hadn't decided what he was going to say to Professor McGonagall when the bell rang at the end of the lesson. But it was she who brought up the subject of Hogsmeade first. One moment, please, she called as the class made to leave. As you're all in my house, you should have handed Hogsmeade permission forms to me before Halloween. No form, no visiting the village, so don't forget. Neville put up his hand. Please, uh, Professor, I, I think I've lost... Your grandmother sent yours to me directly, Longbottom, said Professor McGonagall. She seemed to think it was safer. Well, that's all. You may leave. Ask her now, Ron hissed at Harry. Oh, but Hermione began. Go for it, Harry, said Ron stubbornly. Harry waited for the rest of the class to disappear, then headed nervously for Professor McGonagall's desk. Yes, Potter? Harry took a deep breath. Professor, my aunt and uncle uh, forgot to sign my form, he said. Professor McGonagall looked over her square spectacles at him, but didn't say anything. So, uh, do you think it would be alright? I mean, will it be okay if I, if I go to Hogsmeade? Professor McGonagall looked down and began shuffling papers on her desk. I'm afraid not, Potter, she said. You heard what I said. No form, no visiting the village. That's the rule. But Professor, my aunt and uncle, you know they're they're muggles. They don't really understand about about Hogwarts forms and stuff, Harry said, while Ron egged him on with vigorous nods. If you said I could go... But I didn't say so, said Professor McGonagall, standing up and piling her papers neatly into a drawer. The form clearly states that the parent or guardian must give permission. She turned to look at him with an odd expression on her face. Was it pity? I'm sorry, Potter, but that's my final word. You'd better hurry, or you'll be late for your next lesson. There was nothing to be done. Ron called Professor McGonagall a lot of names that greatly annoyed Hermione. <laughs> Hermione. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, cute. I wonder what he said. Hermione assumed an all-for-the-best expression that made Ron even angrier, and Harry had to endure everyone in the class talking loudly and happily about what they were going to do first once they got into Hogsmeade. There's always the feast, said Ron, in an effort to cheer Harry up. You know, the Halloween feast in the evening. Yeah, said Harry, gloomily. Great. The Halloween feast was always good, but it would taste a lot better if he was coming to it after a day in Hogsmeade with everyone else. Nothing anyone said made him feel any better about being left behind. Dean Thomas, who was good good with a quill, 
had offered to forge Uncle Vernon's signature on the form, but as Harry had already told Professor McGonagall he hadn't had it signed, that was no good. Ron half-heartedly suggested the invisibility cloak, but Hermione stamped on that one, reminding Ron what Dumbledore had told them about the Dementors being able to see through them. Percy had what were possibly the least helpful words of comfort. They make a fuss about Hogsmeade, but I assure you, Harry, it's not all it's cracked up to be, he said seriously. All right, the sweet shop's rather good, but Zonko's joke shop, frankly, is dangerous, and yes, the shrieking shack's always worth a visit, but really, Harry, apart from that, you're not missing anything. On Halloween morning, Harry awoke with the rest and went down to breakfast, feeling thoroughly depressed, though doing his best to act normally. We'll bring you lots of sweets back from Honeyduke, said Hermione, looking desperately sorry for him. Yeah, loads, said Ron. He and Hermione had finally forgotten their squabble about Crookshanks in the face of Harry's disappointment. Don't worry about me, said Harry, mm. in what he hoped was an offhand voice. I'll see you at the feast. Have a good time. He accompanied them at the entrance hall, where Filch, the caretaker, was standing inside the front doors, checking off names against a long list, peering suspiciously into every face, and making sure that no one was sneaking out who shouldn't be going. "'Staying here, Potter,' shouted Malfoy, who was standing in line with Crabbe and Goyle. "'Scared of passing the Dementors?' Harry ignored him and made his solitary way up the marble staircase. "'Good, ignorance is better. Hmm. Pass for him. Yeah. "'Through the deserted corridors and back to Gryffindor Tower. "'Password,' said the fat lady, jerking out of a doze. "'Fortuna Major,' said Harry listlessly. "'The portrait swung open, and he climbed through the hole into the common room.' It was full of chattering first and second years, and a few older students, who had obviously visited Hogsmeade so often, the novelty had worn off. Harry! Harry, hi! Harry! It was Colin Creevy, a second year who was deeply in awe of Harry, and never missed an opportunity to speak to him. Aren't you going to Hogsmeade, Harry? Why not? Hey! Colin looked eagerly around at his friends. You can come and sit with us if you like, Harry. Uh, no thanks, Colin said Harry, who wasn't in the mood to have a lot of people staring avidly at the scar on his forehead. I, uh, I've got to go to the library. Got some work done. After that, he had no choice but to turn right around and head back out the portrait hole again. What was the point of waking me up? The fat lady called grumpily after him as he walked away. Harry wandered dispiritedly towards the library, but halfway there, he changed his mind. He didn't feel like working. He turned around and came face to face with Filch, who had obviously just seen off the last of the Hogsmeade visitors. "'What are you doing?' Filch snarled suspiciously. "'Nothing,' said Harry truthfully. "'Nothing,' spat Filch, his jowls quivering unpleasantly. "'A likely story. Stinking around on your own. Why aren't you in Hogsmeade buying stink pellets and belch powder and whizzing worms like the rest of your nasty little friends?' Harry shrugged. Well, get back to your common room where you belong, snapped Filch, after he stood glaring at Harry until he passed out of sight. But Harry didn't go back to the common room. He climbed a staircase, thinking vaguely of visiting the Owlery to see Hedwig, and was walking along another corridor when a voice from inside one of the rooms said, Harry? Harry doubled back to see who had spoken, and met Professor Lupin looking around his office door. What are you doing? said Lupin, in a very different voice from Filch. Where are Ron and Hermione? Hogsmeade, said Harry, in a would-be casual voice. Ah, said Lupin. He considered Harry for a moment. Why don't you come in? I've just taken delivery of a Grindelow for our next lesson. A what? said Harry. He followed Lupin into his office. In the corner stood a very large tank of water, a sickly green creature with sharp little horns had its face pressed against the glass, pulling faces and flexing its long, spindly fingers. A water demon, said Lupin, surveying the Grindelow thoughtfully. We shouldn't have much difficulty with him, not after the cappers. The trick is to break his grip. You notice the abnormally long fingers? Strong, but very brittle. The Grindelow bared its green teeth and then buried itself in a tangle of weed in a corner. Cup of tea, Lupin said, looking around for his kettle. I was just thinking of making one. All right, said Harry awkwardly. 
Lupin tapped the kettle with his wand, and a blast of steam issued suddenly from the spout. That's handy. <laughs> Sit down, said Lupin, taking the lid off a dusty tin. I've only got tea bags, I'm afraid, but I dare say you've had enough of tea leaves. Harry looked at him. Lupin's eyes were twinkling. How did you know about that? Harry asked. Professor McGonagall told me, said Lupin, passing Harry a chipped mug of tea. You're not worried, are you? No, said Harry. He thought for a moment of telling Lupin about the dog he'd seen in Magnolia Crescent, but decided not to. He didn't want Lupin to think he was a coward, especially since Lupin already seemed to think he couldn't cope with a bogart. Something of Harry's thoughts seemed to have shown on his face, because Lupin said, Anything worrying you, Harry? No, Harry lied. He drank a bit of tea and watched the Grindelow brandishing a fist at him. Yes, he said suddenly, putting his tea down on Lupin's desk. You know that day we fought the Bogart? Yes, said Lupin slowly. Why didn't you let me fight it? said Harry abruptly. Lupin raised his eyebrows. I would have thought that was obvious, Harry, he said, sounding surprised. Harry, who had expected Lupin to deny that he'd done anything, any such thing, was taken aback. Why? he said again. Well, said Lupin, frowning slightly, I assumed that if the Bogart faced you, it would assume the shape of Lord Voldemort. Harry stared. Not only was this the last answer he'd expected, but Lupin had said Voldemort's name. The only person Harry had ever heard say the name aloud, apart from himself, was Professor Dumbledore. Clearly I was wrong, said Lupin, still frowning at Harry. Um, what about Hagrid in like a really quiet way? Just yeah. his name. I said the I can't spell it. Yeah, I remember yeah. that. Yeah. He what did. was his name? Oh my god, I can't say it. Hagrid. No. Voldemort. Voldemort. Yeah. Oh just said god. it like four times. Still I know, Voldemort. no, I know. My brain just, brain just shut yeah. shut it out. Okay. Yeah. But I didn't think it a good idea for Lord Voldemort to materialise in the staff room. I imagine that people would panic. I did think of Voldemort at first, said Harry honestly, but then I I remembered those Dementors. I see, said Lupin thoughtfully. Well, well, I'm impressed, he smiled slightly at the, lack of, at the look of surprise in Harry's face. That suggests that what you fear most of all is fear. Very wise, Harry. Harry didn't know what to say to that, so he drank some more tea. So you've been thinking that I didn't believe you capable of fighting the Bogart, said Lupin shrewdly. Well, yeah, said Harry. He was suddenly feeling a lot happier. Professor Lupin, you know the Dementors. He was interrupted by a knock on the door. Come in, called Lupin. The door opened and in came Snape. He was carrying a goblet, which was smoking faintly and stopped at the side of Harry, his black eyes narrowing. Ah, Severus, said Lupin, smiling. Thanks very much. Could you leave it here on the desk for me? Snape set the smoking goblet down, his eyes wandering between Harry and Lupin. I was just showing Harry my Grindelow, said Lupin pleasantly, pointing at the tank. <clears throat> Fascinating, said Snape, without looking at it. You should drink that directly, Lupin. Yes, yes, I will, said Lupin. I made an entire cauldron full, Snape continued. If you need more... I should probably take some take some again tomorrow. Thanks very much, Severus. Not at all, said Snape, but there was a look in his eye Harry didn't like. He backed out of the room, unsmiling and watchful. Harry looked curiously at the goblet. Lupin smiled. Professor Snape has very kindly concocted a potion for me, he said. I've never been much of a potion brewer, and this one is particularly complex. He picked up the goblet and sniffed it. Pity sugar makes it useless, he added, taking a sip and shuddering. Why? Harry began. Lupin looked at him and answered the unfinished question. I've been feeling a bit off colour, he said. This potion is the only thing that helps. I'm very lucky to be working alongside Professor Snape. There aren't many wizards who are up to making it. Professor Lupin took another sip, and Harry had a mad urge to knock, to knock the goblet out of his hands. Professor Snape's very interested in the dark arts, he blurted out. Really? said Lupin, looking only mildly interested as he took another gulp of potion. Some people reckon, Harry hesitated, then plunged recklessly. 
Some people reckon he'd do anything to get the Defence Against the Dark Arts job. Lupin drained the goblet and pulled a face. Disgusting, he said. Well, Harry, I'd better get back to work. I'll see you at the feast later. <laughs> Harry. So he'd do anything to get the job. Oh, what, what? what was that? <laughs> right, said Harry, putting his empty teacup down. The empty goblet was still smoking. There you go, said Ron. We got as much as we could carry. A shower of brilliantly coloured sweets fell into Harry's lap. It was dusk, and Ron and Hermione had just turned up in the common room, pink-faced from the cold wind. So they just left for a day? Yeah, they just... To their families? No, to Hogsmeade. Hogsmeade. It's like the little village next to Hogwarts. With the pubs. How long did they go for? Just a day. Oh, just a day. Oh, so he couldn't go because he didn't have his parents saying he could go? That's the stupidest rule ever. I would let him go because I took kind of took care of him when he was a little baby and gave him off to his mean family, you know? Why would they do that to him? You'll find out why they didn't let him go. Oh, There's a specific... They're protecting him yes. from something. From those dementors. In any other instance, they would be like, yeah, whatever, you can go yeah. there, it's fine. But Why don't I just tell him they were protecting you? Because it's not they don't just the Dementors. It's the whole serious Black thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <sighs> it was dusk, and Ron and Hermione had just turned up in the common room, pink-faced from the cold wind, and looking as though they'd had the time of their lives. Yeah. Thanks, said Harry, picking up a packet of tiny black pepper imps. What's Hogsmeade like? Where did you go? By the sound of it, everywhere. Dervish and bangers, the wizarding equipment shop, Zonko's joke shop, into the three broomsticks for foaming mugs of hot butterbeer, oh. and many place besides. I'd love butterbeer, by the way. Just, Have you had it before? No, I'd, I'd love to try it, though. Do you think it tastes like butter or beer? No, I think it tastes like... looks like creaming soda sort of concoction. It looks like a soft drink that they put like some sort of cream on top. They serve it at theme parks. It's not alcoholic, so oh, okay. it must be. Is this alcoholic? I don't think so. They're no. kids, yeah. Oh, I, I don't think it's alcoholic. When Hermione drinks it in uh, Half Blood Prince, though, she gets a little bit like ooh. So maybe it's a bit. Oh, that makes noise. Yeah, that's alright. Uh, maybe when they're older, it's alcoholic. Doesn't matter. Maybe they can yeah touch their wands and alcoholio. I think I would make a lot of coffee with my wand if I was a with, uh, witch. You can't just, like, create coffee out of nothing, though. You could make it. What if, if I turn a water to a coffee? Can I do that? No. You'd need all the ingredients of coffee to make it into coffee. You well, could... I have a machine. Why would I bother? Well, you wouldn't need the machine. You could use magic with the ingredients. Yeah, but why? Yeah. <laughs> there, there's the whole thing oh, about... Oh, if I have, like, coffee beans... Yeah, you could Not do it. Not it be like grind it up. And you bean. could do the whole like Nail coffee bean it. process a lot faster and easier with magic. Okay, you know how some people it. roast their own beans? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, could do yeah. all that really quickly. Yeah. You can't just make it out of nothing. Got it. It's okay. a whole Good. subplot in a later book because the elves make all the food for the feasts and then it like teleports to the table. Mm. Everybody just thinks the food appears, but like oh. they still have to make it, you know? Oh, poor. Yeah, so they're kind of like slaves. Mm. That'll be in another book. I'll okay, get to that later. Okay. Butterbeer and... The post office, Harry. About 200 owls, all sitting on shelves. All colour-coded, depending on how fast you want your letter to get there. Oh, Honeydukes have got a new kind of fudge. They were giving out free samples. There's a bit. Look. We think we saw an ogre. Honestly, they get all sorts of the three broomsticks. Wish we could have brought you some butterbeer. It really, really warms you up. What did you do? said Hermione, looking anxious. Did you get any work done? No, said Harry. Lupin made me a cup of tea in his office, and then Snape came in. He told them all about the goblet. Ron's mouth fell open. And Lupin drank it, he gasped. Is he mad? Hermione checked her watch. We'd better go down, you know. The feast will be starting in a minute. They hurried through the portrait hole and into the crowd, still discussing Snape. 
But if he, you know, Hermione dropped her voice, glancing over see around. If he was trying to, trying to poison Lupin, he wouldn't have done it in front of Harry. Yeah, maybe, said Harry, as they reached the entrance hall and crossed into the great hall. It had been decorated with hundreds and hundreds of candle-lit, filled pumpkins, a cloud of fluttering live bats, and many flaming orange streamers, which were swimming lazily across the stormy ceiling like brilliant water snakes. The food was delicious. Even Hermione and Ron, who were full to bursting with Honeyduke's sweets, managed second helpings of everything. <laughs> Harry kept glancing at the staff table. Professor Lupin looked cheerful, and as well as he ever did, he was talking animatedly to tiny little Professor Flitwick, the charms teacher. Harry moved his eyes along the table to the place where Snape sat. Was he imagining it, or was Snape's eyes flickering towards Lupin more often than was natural? The feast finished with an entertainment provided by the Hogwarts ghosts. They popped out of the walls and tables to do a spot of formation gliding. Nearly Headless Nick, the Gryffindor ghost, had a great success with a reenactment of his own botched beheading. It had been such a good evening that Harry's good mood couldn't even be spoiled by Malfoy, who shouted through the crowd as they all left the hall, The Dementors send their love, Potter. Harry, Ron and Hermione followed the rest of the Gryffindors along the usual path to Gryffindor Tower, but when they reached the corridor, which ended with the portrait of the fat lady, they found it jammed with students. Why isn't anyone going in? said Ron curiously. Harry peered over the heads in front of him. The portrait seemed to be closed. Let me through, please, came Percy's voice, and he came bustling importantly through the crowd. What's the hold up here? You can't all have forgotten the password. Excuse me, I'm, I'm head boy. And then a silence fell over the crowd. From the front first, so that a chill seemed to spread down the corridor, they heard Percy say in a suddenly sharp voice, Somebody get Professor Dumbledore, quick. People's heads turned. Those at the back were standing on tiptoe. What's going on? said Ginny, who had just arrived. Next moment, Professor Dumbledore was there, sweeping towards the portrait. The Gryffindors squeezed together to let him through, and Harry, Ron and Hermione moved closer to see what the trouble was. Oh my, Hermione exclaimed, and grabbed Harry's arm. The fat lady had vanished from her portrait, which had been slashed so viciously the strips of canvas littered the floor. Great chunks of it had been torn away completely. Dumbledore took one quick look at the ruined painting and turned his eyes sombre to see Professor McGonagall, Lupin and Snape hurrying towards him. We need to find her, said Dumbledore. Professor McGonagall, please go to Mr Filch at once and tell him to search every painting in the castle for the fat lady. You'll be lucky, said a cackling voice. It was Peeves the poltergeist. Bobbing over the crowd and looking delighted, as he always did, at the sight of wreckage or worry. What do you mean, Peeves? said Dumbledore calmly, and Peeves' grin faded a little. He didn't dare taunt Dumbledore. Instead, he adopted an oily voice that was no better than his cackle. Ashamed, your headship, sir. Doesn't want to be seen. She's a horrible mess. Saw her running through the landscape up on the fourth floor, sir, dodging beneath the trees, crying something dreadful, he said happily. Poor thing, he added, unconvincingly. Did she say who did it? said Dumbledore quietly. Oh yes, Professor Head, said Peeves, with the air of one cradling a large bombshell in his arms. He got very angry when she didn't let him in. You see, Peeves flipped over and grinned at Dumbledore from between his own legs. Nasty temper he's got, that serious black. Yeah, I can hear Gigi. It's, it's so... Babe, it's so... Hmm, no? You want to come here, little girl? I feel like she's like next to me. That's how close it Gigi. is in my ears. Gigi. It's okay, just, just finish it. No, she, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I said, just finish it. What'd you think? Cool. Cool? It was that in the book, in the movie? What was bit? It? What? This bit. Where the fat lady goes missing? No. The part that they leave the school for the day. Yeah. Um, I don't remember this conversation with Lupin though. No, so that bit didn't happen. Instead it was yeah. just like Harry just like moping going like, Oh, I can't go but like they showed um that they left. They showed Ron and Hermione. Yeah, no, I meant like, the Lupin bit. That's what No. I mean. 
they kind of cut a lot of those little bits. Yeah. But don't know why. Because they had to fill in the hour or something. I think possibly because uh, all those scenes kind of referenced what they were going to do in the class next. Yeah. And the movies really cut like all the class stuff that wasn't essential. Yeah. Like in the movie they left in Professor Trollney's lesson. Mm-hmm. where she was like, you got the grim because it's mm-hmm. essentially yep. a story. Yep. They left in uh, the Bogart yep. lesson because it was essential for Lupin to kind of know that Harry Bogart was a, a dementor so that he could teach him the spell. Like, they, they couldn't cut that sort of stuff. And mm-hmm. they generally throw in, like, one potions less in each movie just because they want to give Snape and Alan Rickman some screen time. But other than that, they, they generally gut all the lessons. Oh! That was loud too. Yeah. I heard that. She tripped. But yeah, no, other than that, that was just a good little chapter. Mm. Or long, I'm not sure. The camera might have cut off. No, it has I'll find out when I. Up. It would make a noise. No, it makes a noise like five minutes after it cuts out. Mm. So if we oh, hear a click, that sad. means it's been off for five minutes. Oh. Okay. Should we sign off? Or do you have yeah. anything to say? I don't have anything to say. Either. No. Okay. I'm good. Thanks for watching. See you soon. See ya. Bye. Bye.